Designed from the ground up, the D'Addario Backline Gear Transport Pack is the ultimate solution for players on the move. With more than eight specialized storage and transport compartments built right in, it makes getting everything to the gig painless and intuitive. Right on. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Perry with Premier Guitar here in Nashville, Tennessee. Today we have Touche Amore's Clayton Stevens with us. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Um, I've, I've been excited to do this one for a long time. I'm, I'm a big fan and uh, you guys kind of got the shaft because Lament came out and then COVID hit like what, like a month later or something, like two months later. Yeah, I mean, we, we recorded it and while, like basically as we were finishing it, um, the lockdown started. So... <sighs> Uh, in, in Los Angeles. Um, so yeah, it was right at that time uh, in March. And then we just, you know, thought about like, oh, should we put it off? Should we do whatever? And it just kind of felt like all these other bands are pushing it off. So let's put it out there and just kind of see what happens, you know? And Yeah. Um, did you guys get any kind of shows or touring in between post-production post -production and lockdown? No, all, yeah. Or? So we... Uh, we were recording and, you know, in the midst of recording, we were hearing about the virus and <laughs> all the stuff going on. And then it got more and more serious as we were recording. And then, uh, like I said, like essentially in the last day or two that we were finishing, the lockdown began. So we kind of finished and then just went home. <laughs> and I mean, we, we lived here too, you know, we did it in LA. So, um, but we just went home and, you know, we've hardly played together, hardly done anything since. Wow. So it's kind of just an interesting, I've never been, we've never been, we've actually never released a record where it didn't come out while we were on tour right. on the road already. So it's a totally different experience that way. Wow. So, um, you know, over the course of lockdown, have you guys had the opportunity to kind of like write or do you guys send each other parts or anything like that? No, I mean, we're, we're, we're working out some stuff. Um, we're thinking about trying to record some stuff and, uh, but probably just like some covers and some fun stuff just kind of just put up out there. And, um, but I mean, this, this took so much mental energy and all of that stuff and we really believe in it. So I think we kind of want to let this sit in that way. Uh, we did a live stream, uh, a couple weeks after the record came out and we worked super hard on that and uh, that was really cool. But I think we all felt like, that was great. We pulled off what we were trying to do, but that's not like what we're trying to do. You yeah. know what I mean? That's not, that's not us. So like, it was a great experience, but for now, I think maybe we'll do another one of those, but mostly just kind of waiting it out, hoping that uh, touring can resume at some point. Yeah. I, I'd have to agree with you guys. Lament is an incredible record um, and it deserves at least a couple of tours, man. That's, it's just so good. Well, um, Thank you. With, with that said, um, I've kind of known you guys as, you know, it's it's not com I, I, maybe not as common for post hardcore bands to um, play the gear that you guys do. You know, a lot of a lot of people wouldn't expect you know Fender amps and single coil guitars and strats and stuff. Right. And I think I've seen you with a lot of strats and tellies and a lot of Fender style guitars and amps um, in the in the past when I've seen you guys. Is that how you r record as well? Are you taking your own gear into the studio, or are you guys just kind of stacking whatever sounds great? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the guitars, definitely, like, the single coil kind of plays a big element for us. Um, it's sort of the sound that, I don't know, we just developed, and it's become a part of our identity. Um, and so even, you know, it's like we're open. We always go in like, oh, maybe we'll try this and plug in a Les Paul. It's like, eh, it just doesn't sound right. It's just not who we are. Um, you know, originally, I think I kind of did it because... Um, I was going after more of like what like mono and like Godspeed You Black Emperor and that type of stuff was I, I liked the sounds that they were getting and so that was more what I was interested and even if we're going for more of like the traditional like screamo sound and stuff like Portraits of Past right right they had this like jangly just like in your face single coil fender sound and so that's that's more what I was going after and it was you know it's like 
all the bands we're playing with or our friends at the time in hardcore bands are playing 5150s, which are cool in their own right, but it was like it's another way to stand out and do something different. And uh, so I think it developed out of all of that stuff. And so, yeah, we do go into the, the studio with that stuff. Um, I used a uh, one of the reissue 68 Deluxe Reverbs for pretty much the um, bulk of my guitar tracks. Uh, the bulk of Nick's guitar tracks were done on a uh, mid '60s uh, AC30, oh, um, cool. which was a little different from usually we're using American style stuff at least like 6L6 amps or 6550s. Um, but that one just had a really special, awesome thing. It's, it was one of uh, Ross Robinson's. Oh. <laughs> um, and so uh, yeah, he he was like, "Let's try this out," and we all kind of like, "Whoa, that thing is gnarly." <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we used that for a lot of it, and then. Um, Sort of the extra guitar tracks would be like uh, the amp that I'm using today, which is a, a 90s 65 reissue twin reverb. And then a uh, Mesa Lone Star, which is Nix, which again, kind of a American style amp. Totally. Great sounding amps for sure. Well, um, before we get on to amps, let's, let's talk guitars. Is this your number yeah. one that you have on? Yeah, this is, this is my number one right here. This is a uh, Nash uh s63 Those, model love nash man they, they do some, such cool stuff oh it's incredible um i was turned on to these by um zach from rise against actually he turned me on to nash and uh britain who works there and uh and so yeah i i've owned a couple i've had a telecaster of theirs as well and then i got this and i think 2014 um and it's kind of gone in and out. And then in the last couple of years, I've just totally re in love with the Strat. So this has become my number one. Um, and on the record, this was for sure my number one. Uh, this this got used all over the place. Man, I love the finish that the um, the spray over is just so cool looking. Yeah. So yeah, it's a uh, sunburst underneath and then it's a sonic blue on top. <laughs> That's funny that you mentioned Zach because that dude has actually gotten me into a ton of gear. <laughs> and, oh yeah. I mean, and yeah. a bunch of mods that I wasn't aware of beforehand, you know, like if yeah. I, he, he has this um, JCM 800 with a presence mod. I don't know if you've ever seen that thing, but man, if I had known about that when I was younger, I probably would have <laughs> right. spent a lot, yeah, time, yeah. a lot less time searching for stuff. Yeah. But. He's, he, he, he's a total, you know, gear nerd and he, uh, he gets the sound that we go for and, uh, you know, just talking about guitars and stuff and turned me on to it and very thankful. And then my other kind of number one is this guy, which is a Telecaster of some kind. It's American. It's super heavy. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what model it is. I've asked some people at Fender and there's some things about it that are kind of strange. So I, I'm kind of think it was a American neck put on an American body but that don't match weird uh, um, it's, it's a super heavy one so this one this one I've seen the most time on the road by far um, this is kind of the old reliable I this one has no it's never had a problem I beat the crap out of it and um, yeah so this is this is my friend Tim passed away a few years ago and uh, so yeah this one yeah, this is this is an also great number one right here. Yeah, that's killer. Now, with either of these, did you modify anything? Have you swapped out the pickups or anything, or just kind of left them be? So the Strat, these are Lawlers, which is what comes in, I think, every Nash, basically. Um, I don't know which exact model, but probably the ones that come in whatever S63 you would right. find. Um, this one has Fender-branded noiseless pickups. Um, I bought this guitar in probably 2010 or 11. Oh, okay. Um, and it was already a little old. So sometime in the mid 2000s, I, I think. How do, how do the noiseless uh, pickups hold up? Are they, are they pretty noiseless? Yeah, or? I mean, they, they, they are. Um, they don't sound like the current Fender noiseless ones. I'll say that. Right. Um, I have, like, I'll bring on the road a lot too. I have a... Uh, is it the American Professional Jaguar, which has their kind of version of noiseless Jaguar pickups in it, which are really cool and spanky and awesome, but they're just different, you know? Um, I tried the Telecasters and the newest, they sound great too, but this one just has a slightly maybe darker sound. And I also think that's because, like I said, it's a really heavy piece of wood. Um, 
And so compared to most Telecasters, it has a little bit of a thicker, darker sound, I would say. Interesting. So um, when you're switching between those two, uh, well, I guess, do you guys play all in standard? So we're half step down. Okay. Uh, about half our songs are in standard, T sharp, and then drop tuned uh, some songs, you know, drop deep or whatever, C sharp. Um, and then we have one tuning that's standard, but uh, the F sharp is F. Gotcha. Uh, and that's that's on a few songs. It's sort of a. It was written on our second record. We had a, something that Nick wrote in that tuning, and then we've kind of brought that tuning along with us like each record will at least write one or two songs in that tuning so that we can kind of build up a catalog in that tuning because it would cool. be like oh we only have one song in this tuning it's kind of <laughs> annoying uh in six years you could do yeah. a whole set of that one <laughs> right exactly <laughs> exactly so are you um basically using your strat as a number one and, and the telly as a backup in case you are break a string or it, it depends it depends i mean there'll be times when I play this for a week straight or I play the Telecaster for a week straight. Um, just kind of whatever I'm feeling in the moment. Um, but like I said, when it came to Lament and the studio, this really became the number one, like the clear number one. So I think going forward, this will probably get a lot more time gotcha. than the Telecaster. But the Telecaster, like I said, it's kind of, it's old reliable, you know? Yeah, th those things, I mean, it's, it, it's what, 60-year-old technology that just... It works, you know? It works, yeah, exactly. Totally, those are great. Yeah. So obviously, especially with a, like a real chunky Telecaster, there, there might be some sonic differences between a Tele and a, and a Strat. Are you using any kind of EQ to compensate between the two, or just going for it? No, yeah. just going for it. I mean, really, yeah. I guess single coil to single coil isn't that huge of a difference, especially if you're stacking gain stages and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, we're not to gain heavy anyways and a, a lot of times what we're doing is we have a sort of i'm i'm just playing dynamics and so i'm playing i i'm more just playing to the guitar i feel like i can kind of do it just with my hands oh awesome that yeah. allows me to do that yeah, yeah are, so i mean you know there are some parts of your songs that I wouldn't call them high gain, but you know, like definitely have a lot of drive sure. going on. Are you using, you know, the volume control or a, a volume pedal to kind of dial it back and ramp it up or? I've experimented with that in the past, um, but now usually what I'm doing is I have sort of like, this is the, the amount of gain I truly need and I can live with just this amount of gain and then I'll give myself an extra gain stage. Oh, that's fun. And that's like for when I need, really want to kick it in or um, if it's just sounding thin for some reason or whatever. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, well, as a guy playing, what did you say you are playing a deluxe reverb? That's what I played in the studio uh, live. Right now I'm playing a twin reverb. Twin reverb. Great amp. Um, and anybody that's you know played those style of Fender amps knows that they're uh, you know typically a, a pedal platform because they have a very, very high mm -hmm. headroom. So is that kind of your approach is to let the amp get you yep. to the volume you need yep. and then use your pedals for everything else, huh? Yeah, that's that's Nick and I's approach basically. It's just loud, clean headroom, um, and then just push it with not necessarily distortion, more of a drive, right? Um, kind of thing. Gotcha. If well, that makes sense. That um that leads me into this. So <laughs> I was going down a rabbit hole on U YouTube a couple of weeks ago and found a video for um a pedal that you guys did a collab with called the Limelight. You wanna? Yes. You should talk about that because that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, really excited about it. Um, so John at uh, Electronic Audio Experiments, uh, we became friends some years ago through mutual friends and met him at a show. And I've just been like really impressed with his stuff and his company. I just think it's awesome, and they make really unique, interesting stuff. And so, um, you know, I guess all the so many bands have kind of done this thing now that we were like maybe we should reach out to someone, but it would kind of have to be the right fit and you know, all that. So we reached out to John and he was super enthusiastic about it. Um, so the cool thing is this has been going on for so long now. We've been talking about this idea that we basically emailed back and forth for a couple months about like, Oh, I love this pedal. I love this. Like, I like this about this pedal. I like this about this pedal. And, uh, he came up with a brand new circuit. He sent it to us. We got to bring it on the road. Oh, wow. Or actually, he, for, he actually came to a show. We brought it with us on the road. And then each night, Nick and I would trade putting it on our boards. 
and then just be like, okay, what didn't work about it? And fine tuned it on the road, which is an amazing just opportunity that, because, right. you know, sometimes it's like if you're developing something like that, you can just, you're sit. It's like I got to hear it in different rooms and different ways and whatever. So we got to really fine tune it. Um, and the whole idea was like, it needs to be just a utilitarian thing that we use. And it's something that like, I, I it, it could it could be my drive and all that in one. So it's a boost on one side, just a one knob boost. And then the other side is uh, the gain, the overdrive essentially. And like I said, it's sort of based on like combining a tube screamer and uh, a blues breaker, oh, okay. but it's a unique, but it's a unique circuit that he actually designed from the ground up. Um, so <laughs> how cool. <laughs> Yeah, so it's amazing, um, and so I like it because for that reason, like obviously, just the fact that it it isn't actually a clone of something else. I think that's so cool. Um, right, right. And then, legitimately, it got used on every guitar track in the studio, whether that was just the boost or the boost and drive combined. Right. It's just super dynamic. It's super clear, and um, that's and bright, which is right. all the things yeah. that we really like. Man, it. it it's such a good idea for you guys because you know like if like worst case scenario the airline lost your pedal board or something and you just had that one pedal and a backline fender amp you could kind of pull off that's exactly right your that, thing that, it, exactly yeah yeah and uh just so and uh i don't know when this is coming out but we will be doing more at some point gotcha so probably so, in next year we'll do another you know so it's it's a really small company uh, it's basically just John and a couple of friends helping him out building them. So we, we made a few hundred of them and they sold out, which is great, but we want to make sure that people get them and get them at the right price. And all that stuff, so. That's so cool. So if you guys are watching at home, you'll have to, uh, you know, check their socials and see when that gets re-released. Cause that'd be, I would love to check that pedal out myself. The demos I've heard sounded incredible. So good on you. Thanks. Yeah. So what listening through your records, I've been a fan for what a decade now, and it doesn't seem like there's a ton of modulation effects going on. Like you guys kind of keep it rock and roll, but I, I I do feel like I've heard a little delay and some other things. So what else? What other kind of pedals do you have on your board? So, so on the board that I'm using right now, which I kind of developed because of the studio, and this again sort of feels like a utilitarian setup for me. It's like I can plug this into any amp any back line because you know you never know like right. you know um and feel like i can do everything i need to do so we got the limelight and then um the also electronic audio experiments long sword which is his distortion unit so gotcha. that's my kind of second gain stage which really i'm just using it as a just boosting kind of like limelight. a clean boost yeah gotcha exactly i'm just thickening it up with that uh then it goes to a mr black mini chorus oh um, which is just an amazing pedal that I can't believe. It's like the thickest, fullest sounding chorus I've ever heard. It was tough to find something that could replicate because the main effect that I think we were switching out in the studio a lot is chorus. We're very, I, both Nick and I, and actually Ross are like very particular about chorus and having the right gothy chorus sound. So... <laughs> Some songs it would be like an old CE2. Some songs it would be like a weird DOD one. Some songs it was like a weird, uh, what was it? It's like a Ibanez stereo one that barely works. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I need something that could kind of do a little of all that. And um, I'm super happy with that. So that can't recommend it. It's only $99 too, which That's is unbelievable. That's so cool. Yeah, man, uh, Chorus has always been kind of a, a, a tricky one for me because it's, you know, kind of back in style now, but if you are like me and grew up through the 90s, there can be too much freaking chorus on stuff sometimes, uh, right. you know? Yeah, like, yeah, totally. I, I wasn't much of a chorus person um, until I really, like, you know, around 2010 and so, or so, I kind of really dove deep into the, like, what I call the golden era of 4AD records, the Cocktoo Twins and that in modern English, right. uh, that whole sound. And so that's the kind of chorus that I lean towards, less the like Nirvana. Right, uh, right. Smells, you know what I mean? Like, which that's a great chorus sound on its own, the sort of rotary chorus sound. Right. But I like the thicker, almost like 
creating a, a te like a almost ambient texture right with right the chorus as opposed to like like what we were yeah right. we're saying the sort of cheesy yeah, like, 90s <laughs> yeah thing, I, I think yeah. A, a, a really great chorus can almost like it's almost indiscernible and can almost come across like a like a, like a double track guitar sometimes just like right, exactly. that wall of sound thing it's really really yeah. cool and, and we're into the like jangly guitar thing too so it kind of works with what we like to do anyways and that and sometimes doing like almost a 12 string kind of sound right right course. yeah really uh, cool um right on what else we got on that board so then we'll go to the ibanez mini analog delay the classic oh the little tiny one yeah those are great yeah yeah it's great um I've always been an analog delay person, never really jumped too far into the digital delay stuff. Like you said, we're not super modulated. I just, I like the sound of an analog delay. Sometimes like always on in, at times. Like right. that, just a little slap back. So that's mo mostly what I'm doing with that. It's just slap back. And then um, the next thing is the TC Electronics flashback. And it's kind of my jumping into, <laughs> again, the mini flashback, because uh, I can't have anything that's too complicated, <laughs> just simple. Um, but it's 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 me trying out some digital delay stuff, and that's really just to do a longer delay time. Gotcha. Yeah. Which so those are like, th those are amazing pedals. Oh Super my god. Fun. Um, and I've started messing around with like you know the tone print app thing and all of that stuff. So because normally I was using like a. Um, like a tape style delay. Like I had a Mr. Mm -hmm. Echo for many years. I still have that. That gets used all the time in the studio, but I kind of want to keep that at home now. It's, you know, stuff like that. So for live purposes, this does that. And um, it's awesome. Yeah. Man, <laughs> when I first um, started reviewing some pedals with the tone prints, I was, you know, at first it almost sounds like, ah, oh, this is kind of like a marketing thing. Because, I mean, realistically, it's probably just an EQ shift of some sort. But really, they the breadth of tone prints is like kind of amazing. Like it that's, is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a future. And even, man. It, I mean, even the fact that they have ones where you can add saturation. Right. And I haven't really gone into that whole world of it, but I've messed around with it and been like, wow, you actually hear saturation on this. Like it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So a versatile little thing that I'm probably super underusing. But it's uh, it's small and it gives me a long delay time, so that's the main reason I have it. And then at the end is the Mr. Black Eterna, um, which is, you know, sort of a modern classic, I would say. Um, and it's, I I love the long reverb trails on it. It's just ridiculous. Um, I think it, I think it's sort of becoming a modern classic because, it's, it's a long, reverb, um, but. It just sounds, it just makes everything sound beautiful. You right. Know? And what's cool is like we even use it with like keyboards and stuff. It sounds amazing. Oh, cool. With keyboards and stuff like that. So that's on there. And then I just use a little touch of reverb from the amp these days. That's yeah, I, I guess that, that was going to be my next question. You know, with the Fender reverbs are so lush and classic, but they do a thing, you know. So like, I guess that would make sense if you're looking for maybe a washier. You know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I've always been an, a reverb on at all times person. And that's, that's kind of been a signature of our band in a way. Um, having a touch of reverb always on. So I had a Holy grail forever set that way. Um, but the save space, the Eterna, if I really wanted to, I could make it just a little more of a typical reverb and then just mess with it. Um, if I needed to, but Generally, yeah, I I love the spring reverb on the twin, anyways. And yeah, like it's killer. you put it at two, and there's plenty of reverb. I mean, it's right, right, yeah. <laughs> I had a, it, a, a, a lots of it. I got one of those um, Princeton reverb reissues, and same deal. It's like, wow, that's a that's plenty of reverb if you need it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah, no doubt. Um, but it's like I found for me, it's it's a bit of a crutch because I got so I love it so much that when you don't have reverb, it almost feels. No, yeah, like, absolutely. I, like I feel some, naked without reverb. There's yeah, no totally. I feel yeah. very naked without reverb. Yeah, it. even if it's just like a hint. I need, I, you know, it just, I don't know. It, it, it does something that no other effect does, and I really love it for that reason. Exactly. <laughs> right exactly. on. So, you know, obviously the, the world is, <laughs> everything's up in the air right now, but what's the plan? It, as soon as it's safe for you to guys to really hit it and, 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 and tour Lament or... 
Yeah, I mean, when when things are safe, uh, that that will be when we'll, you know, go back out there. But, um, you know, I think for now we're, of course, it it sucks not being able to and all that stuff. But I'm happy that it happened at this point. You know, in in a way that we're we've been a band so long that it feels like if you know a year goes away, like we're still gonna be around. Right, you know, right. We're I... not we're not going anywhere. So. Um, whenever that happens, it happens. It it sort of feels like overseas will happen first, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah, I've, my heart goes out to all the you know young kids and, and dudes and bands that were just kind of getting it together, and then boom, exactly. it's like shit. Yeah, but, exactly. But, like for 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 a band like us, it's we're relatively lucky in that way. You know, right. it's like we can put out a record and sit on it and wait till we feel good and feel like you know we can throw a show safely and. Right. Everyone can enjoy it the way that we want to enjoy a show, which is sweaty and together and crazy. 100%. 100%. I also think you're totally right about uh, how, in a weird way, we're kind of lucky because if this had happened 10 years ago when, like, you know, broadband speeds just weren't fast enough to do stuff like this, <laughs> like, you know, at least we can stay entertained in our houses and, and, and bands can be putting out records still, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I've caught these things that you guys have been doing and um, stuff like that, I think, is really cool. And that we're getting this sort of like, you know, it is interesting that we are seeing more of people's like the way they are at home or we're seeing them in their own spaces. And that's like become a part of what we see about people and all that stuff. I think that's interesting. And, um, you know, you, you kind of have to take the best with whatever the bad situation is, you know, it's Absolutely, obviously yeah. not a good situation, but I'm, I'm happy to see all the innovation. I've seen a lot of bands doing really cool stuff that I think is really interesting and cool and could be something cool for the future. And like, just because, you know, maybe Touche is more of a traditional band, maybe that's the way that we'll always stay. But I think for the future of music, perhaps there could be other interesting ways of doing it, but we're just sort of a traditionalist band. That's the way we do things. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, Clayton, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and show fans your gear. Um, and I cannot wait until the day that I can jump off of something way too high for my old ass <laughs> at one of your shows <laughs> and sing that. along and, and raise hell. I can't wait. Well, everybody watching at home, thank you so much for watching. This is Perry with Premier Guitar, and we'll see you guys real soon. Thanks.